Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I didn't quite recognize myself, but uh, thank you. The, uh, I would like to say thanks to the Leonard Tim Hector Memorial Committee. Uh, special thanks to Mrs. Jennifer Hector, uh, Mr. Lawrence Jardine, Conrad Luke, Dr. James Knight, George Goodwin, all of whom have been very helpful. Thanks also to the other members who have made this week's activities possible and my visit here uh, possible. Uh, the, I want to begin <clears throat> with the conclusion and we'll see whether in the process of delivering today's lecture, whether the conclusion bears out the substance of the presentation. There's a way in which you can give a lecture and you ask the question, well, where is he or she going with the points that are being developed and with the evidence or the data? Uh, my conclusions are fivefold. <coughs> Uh, and I'm dealing with the topic, conclusion to the topic, with the Caribbean politics. Uh, I want to argue, first of all, that in the Caribbean, each territory has in some way gotten some things right. And it varies according to territory. Some territories have gotten some things right, others something else. Uh, if we are not mindful of this, then we're likely to throw the baby with the bathwater bath in the self-critique and critique. I will identify those things that I think uh, Jamaica has gotten right. Secondly, my second conclusion is that a more aggressive and reasoned struggle for the values that we want to live by, uh, need to focus on a dialogue with young people. There is a deep and profound struggle concerning the values which guide our daily life. And that engagement with young people is critical to the resolution of that uh, particular crisis. Thirdly, the bulk of my talk is concerns political parties. Uh, and the basic conclusion is that the struggle to ensure the criminal link with political parties is a very critical challenge faced by, has been faced by Jamaican political parties, and I'll speak to that. Uh, and the issue of transparency of political parties, uh, the knowledge about how they are financed, how they go about their discussing their business and planning strategy, because the, I'm arguing that the agenda setting needs to be more mass-based, and civil society and the media have an important role to play, roles to play in the holding political parties to account. Whether or not we have a Caribbean political agenda depends a lot on those of us outside political parties in the public as well as what happens inside political parties. Uh, so I make some comments on political party reform and the way in which recent developments over the past three to four years uh, in Jamaica have really put a break uh, certainly on the ability of people to have freedom of expression and to be able to tackle the wide-ranging problems of what economic options we need to pursue, uh, how we deal with structural adjustment, the International Monetary Fund, how we deal with the principle of equity in public life, 
how do we ensure that the burden uh, of, transform of structural adjustment doesn't fall on those who are least able to afford it? And in this regard, certainly the last US presidential elections should provide some indication that it is possible for uh, an agenda for change to be to win the day against the most powerful political force that we have in the world today in the Republican uh, Party that was defeated. Defeating an agenda that was very different from the agenda that uh, the Republicans promoted. Finally, the putting our house in order is the prerequisite for 21st century global change. Um, the Caribbean has to be involved as we were in the 70s uh, in the efforts to change global financial institutions, global public financial institutions, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, Fund as well as global private international institutions, which as a result of the crisis since 2008 have been subject to more financial regulations in the conduct of their businesses. And finally, <clears throat> our ability to be able to deal with environmental challenges. One has only to refer to Sandy and the way Sandy came up from the Caribbean right along the eastern coast of the United States and the damage that it was done at it, it did in the Caribbean as well as in the United States to understand that environmental challenges need to be tackled on a global basis. And our political parties, our governments need to be and our people need to be informed about what these challenges are and how best we can deal with them. So let me begin with my first area, some of the things that we have gotten right. Certainly speaking for Jamaica, in one of his columns rather, Tim Hector wrote, the other day a friend of mine whom I taught literature more than 35 years ago asked me to assist his son with a literature assignment. And suddenly I realized politics and sports are the public passions. Literature with me is a private passion. Outlet, 22nd December 2000. I'll be speaking about one of Tim Hector's public pa passions, politics. So it is important here to mention briefly sports, his other public passion. Certainly the Caribbean performance at the 2012 Olympics was impressive. You seen both three gold medals in 100, 200, and world breaking 4x100 relay. Johan Blake continued to be a very strong competitor. Shelly Ann Fraser winning the 100 meters for the second time in an Olympic competition. Kirani James winning the 400 meters. Keshawn Walcott surprising us with his gold in the men's javelin. And the victory of the Bahamian gold medal relay in the four by 400 meters and the wide ranging uh, participation and pres uh, of the Cubans in field and track. <coughs> then there was the West Indies team winning the world 2020 championship in cricket. There's a lesson for the rest of the region in my view as Jamaica has developed an institutional base for athletics at all levels of the educational system and the annual schools athletics championships function as a nursery, which demonstrates the passion that young people have for track. High school athletics championships started in 1910 and have gathered strength with the merging of male and female athletes. Uh, and that competition has given a boost to the females in that before that time, the women had a separate competition and did not have as much crowd support as the boys. With the merging of the championship, the, women, the women's performances 
are as keenly observed and supported as are the males. Fast students play an important role in supporting their school financially and through giving their time to transport students officiating at the pre-champs meets, financing the nutrition of the athletes, helping to improve the sports facilities. There's also a sports college that was built by the Cubans, the GC Foster College, that trains coaches, so many schools have access to good coaching. In addition, there are athletic clubs for professional levels uh, led by world-class coaches. And the management of athletics is done by the Jamaica Athletics Administrative Association. The passion for track has been built on a vast edifice of volunteerism that goes back a century. So that the athletics is a success story and what is happening with this generation is going to be surpassed by the younger people coming up. Were Tim Hector alive, I'm sure he would have written articles explaining these important developments in track and field and critic. I knew Tim Hector as a comrade and friend. He was mentored by the great Caribbean intellectual Sailor James and belonged to the generation of post-independence thinkers and activists such as Lloyd Best, Walter Rodney, Norman Gervon, Maurice Bishop, and Daye, Jacqueline Kreft, and Eileen Thomas from Jamaica. Eileen Thomas was a comrade of mine, uh, a Jamaican writer uh, who died some years ago. Uh, she'd be less known than many of the other uh, women and men that I've mentioned here. Let me mention an initiative taken by a group of us from the University of West Indies, Mona, between 2001 and 2010. Uh, Brian Meeks, Anthony Bogues, and myself undertook at UWI in establishing a center for Caribbean thought, which held an annual conference to analyze the work of outstanding Caribbean intellectuals. Among those we examined were Walter Rodney, M.G. Smith, the anthropologist, Gordon Lewis from Wales, who settled in Puerto Rico, Sylvia Winter, C.L.R. James, Peter Abraham, the South African writer, who has spent most of his life as a journalist in Jamaica, is still alive. Stuart Hall, uh, George Padmore, the New World Group, uh, George Lamming. Uh, there have been seven volumes in the publication so far uh, in the book series, and the latest is the book that I edited called Caribbean Political Activism, Essays in Honor of uh, Richard Hart. Certainly Richard Hart is, was one of the pioneer uh, Caribbean activists of the 1930s right down to the present time. He's still alive, living in Bristol. He's 95 years old and still continues his writing. I want to turn now to the... I'm, I'm making the point that there is athletics and I have mentioned reggae music, are areas that have emerged out of the independent activity of ordinary Jamaican people. And there's no day you go to the airport that there isn't some uh, artist who is traveling to some part of the world from Asia through to Europe, through to Africa. When I was traveling yesterday evening, uh, the, person, the, the artist in the airport that I saw with his crew was Jack Cure, who some of you uh, may know. Uh, I want to turn to vibes, cartel, and ethics. I want to turn from my generation to those who influence this generation. Let me prefer this uh, turn to vibes, cartel, to the present with a few comments. My high school, Calabar High School, marked the centenary of its founding by Baptist missionaries in 2012. The best known alumnus of Calabar is P.J. Patterson a friend of Tim Hector and successor of Michael Manley as leader of the People's National Party and Prime Minister of uh, Jamaica. Many years ago, or not too many, a year or two before Tim died, my wife and myself took a holiday in Guadeloupe and Antigua. And Tim was able to tell me things about uh, P.J. Patterson that I was totally unaware of. 
Um, he had a good grasp of what was happening in the entire Caribbean uh, area. I had the occasion to give Calabar Centenary Lecture last September and argued that the writing of history cannot only be celebratory. There are also silences in history, and these silences tell us a lot about important moments in our social development. This is reflected in the life of a son of Calabar who has had a huge impact so far on 21st century Jamaican and Caribbean popular culture, which has a global reach. His work reflects a different sociocultural segment of Jamaican society. The urban transitional strata, the unemployed, underemployed, hustlers, ghetto, lumpen. His name is Adija Palmer, otherwise known as Vibes Cartel, who, quote, was expelled from Calabar High School in the 10th grade for truancy, and who admitted, quote, I was calling school to hang out at various corporate area studios. I knew from a tender age that I was destined for a career in music, end quote. Probably the leading lyricist of the dance hall today, his repertoire is wide-ranging, male sexual prowess, gangster behavior, symbolized by the appropriation of Gaza, bleaching, contemporary violence, and at the same time, the voice of the ghetto. He now awaits trial on murder charges. It is a generation that has shifted from gang political violence in Jamaica to cyber fraud. Viber Cartel poses a moral challenge with his lyrics on the scammer song, otherwise known as reparation song. So he has taken the idea of reparations and he has transformed its meaning into the justification of cyber fraud or scamming. And just to quote a few words from his lyrics, which can be found on YouTube, his performance of it with Gaza Slim. Big up every scammer will make US dollar. Build up the house for your mama. Western Union people forgive you more honor. Slash full stop comma. Every, every ghetto fear live like Tony Montana. Presidential like Barack Obama. Pool in a house and playing in a hangar. Who said the scammer them wrong? No hungry poverty, that more wronger. Better them do it than take up the bomber. Remember the youth them now nah squeeze trigger. I just threw them a nigger. End quote. The cyber fraud is estimated to value about 300 million US dollars in recent times. As over the last few months, not a year. One politician has called for the banning of what he calls these antisocial lyrics. Well, the question I ask is, do political parties and their representatives have the moral standing to persuade young people that they are governed by a higher standard? Vibe Cartel's lyrics portray a Robin Hood view of reparations and sanitizes the gun trade and murders attendant on the scamming enterprise. He sings that in scamming the youth are not taking up the gun, but this is not true. Vibe Cartel's way of dealing with history is to perpetuate the values of extortion that were developed in three centuries of enslavement of Africans, which ended in reparations to the slaveholders. Vibe's cultural milieu is partly gangster culture, but broad sections of young people buy into the morality he advocates. He draws on the tradition of black radicalism, and in his biography, he projects himself as a kind of 21st century Malcolm X, as is seen on the cover of his latest uh, publication. He's far more deadly than the hustler Malcolm Little, but has little in common with the activist and leader, Malcolm X. The, the bigger problem that I see is that Vibe Cartel's gangsterism has already put down deep roots not only in Jamaican society, but in the political culture. Vibes also draws on the work of Marcus Garvey, which has resonance in so many parts of the world. In every single Caribbean territory, the Garvey movement had roots. My colleague, Robert Hill, has 
recently published the 11th volume of the Garvey Papers, where he argues that UNIA was substantially in its early New York years a West Indian movement. I just want to mention briefly here that Archbishop Maguire from Antigua played a prominent role in developing the theology of the Garvey movement. However, what the Vibes Cartel episode signals is the collapse of the progressive black nationalist ideas from below, which nurtured reggae, music, and calypso. And this is one of the serious challenges that we face in talking about Caribbean politics. The question is, what is the value system that the population adheres to? And in what way will that value system affect how we think about national and regional politics? The figures for Jamaica's 2011 census have recently re been released, and black persons make up, not surprisingly, 92% of the population. The struggle for self-acceptance by Jamaicans and for Afro-descendants in the Caribbean has been a torturous one and the decades of the 1960s and 1970s were very important in creating greater self-confidence through the struggles of the Black Power Movement. In 2012, the year of Jamaica's 50th independence anniversary, Garvey's 125th anniversary, uh, was marked by the decision of the Jamaican government to introduce elements of Garvey's philosophy into the civics curricula in schools. This is also the year that marked the 100th anniversary of the African National Congress. The connections between these three anniversaries were symbolized in Jamaica by the invitation to President Zuma to be the official guest at the independence celebrations. Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan also participated in the celebrations of Jamaica's 50th anniversary. Garvey had a very big influence, I should mention, on the evolution of the early ANC through the activities of the UNIA, which had branches in Pretoria, Johannesburg, and Cape Town. And the connection with the ANC was direct in the support that Garvey gave to the, in hosting a visit by Solomon Plat Platke, uh, one of the first secretary generals of the ANC at a mass meeting in 1921. Uh, Jamaica joined India in an economic boycott in 1957 against apartheid in South Africa. And in the 1970s, the Jamaican government under Michael Manley established close relations with a number of African liberation movements, among them ANC, Frelimo, M MPLA. And you'll see in the display of Tim Heckler's publications how much that era was, he was an advocate of these movements. Uh, in, the, in Antigua and in the outlet. But one has, at the same time, in marking these celebrations to contend with the deterioration of the ANC, especially in the era of President Zuma, where corruption and enrichment in the state apparatus has grown since Mandela left power. The process of enrichment by political and administrative leadership is one of the key problems in politics today and it is a key challenge facing Caribbean society. These are matters that Tim Hector wrote about and would certainly be write, writing about were he alive, reflecting on 21st century uh, Pan-Africanism. I want to turn to political parties and to, in the interest of time, skip some areas. If we look at po political party formation in Jamaica from 19... 38 until the present time, 2012, we will see the following patterns. Both the People's National Party and the Jamaica Labour Party are products of the national, nationalist movement of the 1930s and 1940s. From 1938 to 1989, the PNP, by and large, was a social democratic uh, party with ideological components constituting a trade union based left wing that gave way in the 1970s to a left wing based on the unemployed and underemployed with strong lumpen social forces who were consolidated 
in a number of garrison constituencies in the west and central areas of Kingston. From the foundation of the party down to the present time, it has had a regional agenda. And in the book that I edited on Richard Hart, one of the comments made by the party founder, Norman Manley, about Richard Hart was his extensive work in the labor movement of the Caribbean uh, islands and of Guyana. The shift, however, to neoliberal politics in the 1980s in the People's National Party resulted in the collapse of party building in the traditional sense and its replacement as an electoral machine. And I'm not saying that winning of elections is not important. It is important. It is primary. But to neglect the other dimensions which enable people to play a more active role in the political institution, uh, to neglect those areas, I think, does a lot to erode what the party had been. This process of party erosion took place especially in the partisan years from 1993 to 2006. Uh, his strength as a political leader has been his non-confrontational approach uh, in Jamaica, and that has helped to ease the political tensions and reduce violence. So whilst I'm critical of him, I'm also mindful of uh, that contribution, which was recognized a week ago in a bipartisan parliamentary uh, sitting honoring his uh, leadership. Until 2012, both parties have rotated in power for 68 years since universal adult suffrage in 1944, with the JLP being the majority party for 34 years and the PNP the majority for another 34 years. So the country has been more or less evenly divided uh, between the, the, the two political parties. I'd like to point out that one of the significant contributions of Patterson to political life was that his leadership from the early 90s to 2006 saw a shift in the socio-racial leadership of the People's National Party from the brown mulatto middle class to the black middle class leadership uh, with a focus on using the state and um, the state and its contracts for enrichment in the same way that the Jewish and light-skinned and white Jamaicans had been doing from the 1940s. There was a whole debate about that in the 90s, but the simple point I'm making here is a promotion uh, in the party as well as to some extent in the economy, although that was not successful because of the financial crash of many enterprises in the 1990s early 1990s. Uh, however, it is fair to say that uh, there has been anemic economic growth over the tenure of both Patterson and subsequent uh, leaders uh, since the 90s. The rise of the growth in inequality, the escalation of the debt to the GDP ratio of uh, which amounted to under, just under 140%, and the rise of the homicide rate to a high of 1680 murders in 2009 in a population of 2.7 million, which put Jamaica in a high homicide uh, category in the top three in the world. And that crime figure really help to contribute to the narrowing of the range of political freedoms that people enjoyed uh, prior to the rise of that homicide rate and the rise of uh, independent political gangs. There's a, a discussion here that I want to leave out, but those of you who have read Paget Henry's uh, the life of V.C. Bird. Uh, he does the framing of the historical 
transition of Antigua from colonialism to independence to the present time very well. Uh, and in this section that I'm going to leave out, uh, he, I, I discuss the, the different ways in which people have been talking about uh, the, the scarred and the defiled democracy in Jamaica. But I, I won't go into that here. The issue that I wanted to raise about criminality and politics really relates to the extradition of Christopher Cook, Christopher Dudas Cook in 2010. Uh, in Jamaica, an extradition which led to the death of over 70 people and which is still awaiting an investigation by a public figure in Jamaica. It's been two years since that has taken place. If one spoke to people inside the Jamaica Labour Party, as I did in the period of 2010, you saw a situation in which the entire party, from top to bottom, from working class, self-employed, market vendor, middle class, businessman, professional, party leader, rallied around this individual. It simply amazes me that such a man, known as the president, could exercise such power. Before Mr. Bruce Golding got, when he, was, when he became leader of the Jamaica Labor Party, before the 2007 elections, um, the question was raised as to which constituency he should represent. The West Kingston constituency that had been uh, run by Mr. Edward Siaga for 40 years, the Don in that constituency rejected two candidates that the party uh, had put forward to run in that constituency. And the Don indicated that only the Prime Minister can run in that constituency. This, this is not, this is not, I'm not inventing this. But my point is not that that is the case. My point is what happens when a political party is so embedded with the a criminal element like that. They are unable to see him in that light. He's seen as a godfather, as a financier, um, and he's loved. Women came out in demonstrations dressed in white against the U.S. And then you have the prime minister who comes to parliament and indicates that he has employed a top United States firm to represent, to seek get legal advice, Manat Felp and Phillips, which was a firm used by the Democratic Party in the United States. And when there was a commission of inquiry on the Prime Minister appeared before that, not only had he been consulting Manat, Philip and Phelps, but he had also gone to the Republican Party seeking advice for legal assistance. I taught a course in 2010 to some social workers, and I was attempting to criticize the system of donmanship. The students just look at me and tell me, you can't go and talk what you're talking. When we have to go to our communities, this is what we have to deal with. This is a de facto situation that we have to negotiate with these power brokers, this situation. So my point about criminality and politics, that's my perspective 
it's not seen that way on the ground in Jamaica by the in certainly people within the Jamaica Labour Party. Uh, so that an entire political apparatus, which was founded out of the labor movement by Bustamante, and whatever criticisms, and there are many criticisms you can make of him, I think he's in the mold of V.C. Bird, but he was the people's champion. The party has become compromised by that. And criticizing the JLP is not to, not to take away the fact that in Jamaica we know who are the linkages that the People's National Party, uh, their linkages in the political life. So the United States and the Obama administration decided that they would not send the ambassador to the United States, to Jamaica, until that situation had been cleared up. It is true to say, however, that civil society really played a big role in ensuring that the process towards that extradition, uh, necessary extradition, took place. And the People's National Party benefited tremendously because their lawyer, uh, K.D. Knight, who uh, had served in the administration, as National Security Minister, uh, did extraordinarily good questioning. And that was the single most important, the Golden JLP administration involvement with the Dudus scandal was the single most in, uh, fa important factor which led to the defeat in the, of the Jamaica Labour Party in the 2011 elections, uh, 42 to 21, 42 seats to the PNP, 21 to the JLP, uh, a huge uh, victory. I want, so I'm making the point here that political parties can be captured and one has to be vigilant that the parties are not captured by elements like these. Uh, and it is a danger. There's a colleague of mine who studies this issue throughout the region. And it has affected many political parties, those linkages and those connections. But nowhere has it been as embedded as it has been in the Jamaican case. And Christopher Koch was literally a third generation um, in, the, in the business, uh, with his father being an important uh, Don himself. So that you literally have a dynasty of Dons who had claimed uh, a hold on the party and who exercised important roles in party campaigning as uh, power people. Uh, so this is, this is an element which I don't think is unique to Jamaica, but it's something that you all need to be aware of. I want to turn to the, to the economy, and Jamaica is now experiencing uh, an negotiations with the International Monetary Fund. And I mentioned that economic performance had been uh, very spotty and Jamaica's indebtedness has grown. And there is no way that we can, in the short run, avoid uh, a structural adjustment agreement. The question which is raised concerns the nature of that agreement, the nature of that, those conditionalities, uh, how they impact on the, those least able to shoulder the burden of adjustments in relationship to salaries, wage negotiations, in relationship to issues of pension payments, uh, the question of those who are able to shoulder taxation, uh, 
those who the question of the Ministry of Finance ability to uh, grant waivers, which is which takes an enormous chunk of revenue uh, costs. So that the issues are really critical in terms of how the Portia Simpson Miller administration goes about the the negotiations in a different way from previous administrations. One should point out that one of the consequences of the Coke affair was that Golding could not settle down to negotiations with the IMF or meeting his share of the bargain. But one of the initiatives that took place that was, I think, of importance is that Jamaican debt is structured in the domestic debt and the foreign debt. Most of our debt is owned domestically. In 2010, there was what is negotiated a debt exchange. The debt exchange meant that government bonds, government paper, that uh, received a haircut. If you were, had bought government paper and expected 10%, it went, was shaved down to 7%. And the period of redemption was removed from, if it was to be redeemed in 2012, it was put to 2013, 2014, which means you could reschedule debts. So there is a whole area of relations because the bulk of the money that is held in the domestic debt is by middle and upper middle class and business people. There's therefore that, that, there's therefore that pull. However, having taken that cut, the, it's, the, it's impossible or it's not, it's not possible to get any relaxation in domestic debt until there is an IMF agreement. Because basically what, what, what that debt that um, reduction, what that JDX, debt ex, Jamaica debt exchange uh, reflected was a failure, the inability of the, a failure in a sense of the regime to meet its contractual obligations. So there is room for maneuver in Jamaica with respect to the social programs and the educational programs. Uh, that need to be preserved if Jamaica is to maintain some level of stability. And that is one of the big challenges that is going to be faced by the People's National Party administration in 2013. My view in terms of the issue of political parties is that these issues, 30 years ago under the Michael Manley government, were a central part of the, what the party discussed. Uh, in the late 1970s, people like George Beckford, an economist, Michael Witter, and some others, were working on alternative programs to the IMF. In other words, government now needs to have to be working on multi-tracks. You are forced into a situation with the International Monetary Fund because of your indebtedness. But you also need to have another track that's going, which is looking at what are the options for social economic development. I want to just turn to a few slides here on the socioeconomic landscape just to indicate some of the, the, the challenges that we face. That's just a brief look at uh, the Jamaican population growth has slowed down uh, considerably. And um, that's a, just a brief profile of where we are now in terms of health, HIV, uh, child malnutrition, adult literacy, and so on. Could you go to the next slide? The, Education aspect, I simply, the state, the state 
over the colonial period and up to today has played an important role and continues in, in education. But I wanted to draw your attention to the dropout rate at primary school. From primary school, you're getting a male-female differential in uh, dropout rate. You're getting 16% uh, percent for males and 9.3% for females. Uh, so the shift is starting from early on. Can we, can we move on? To? Okay, that's, can we move on past gross enrollment ratio? Public education of, um, the public education spending um, as a percentage of gross domestic product is nearly 6%. And public education spending, government spending, is 8.5%. However, the Jamaican budget, we spend over 50% on debt payments and interest. So when you're paying 50% on debt payment and interest, you can put this data into perspective with respect to how your budget is allocated. This is why we say that there should not be any cutbacks in the area of education, and certainly not in the area of health. Can we move on? Yeah, the structure of the Jamaican economy. That big green there uh, indicates service. The service area, services area of the economy is the largest uh, area. This is so for most of the Caribbean. And tourism, of course, remittances, those are the areas that would constitute some of the key income earners. Agriculture is small area, 5%, that blue or purple, depending if you're not colorblind like me. And uh, industry is 25%. Clearly, one of the big strategic questions that will need to be asked we are all selling the same thing in the Caribbean, including Cuba. We are selling sea, sand, and fun. The question is, how varied can that product be? What are the additional areas in services or in industry or in agriculture that we need to think of? Political parties need to present options, have economists, have others working, doing the research, so that there can be a national discussion that involves people on the ground who are in these enterprises, speaking about ways and means of restructuring the economy, and asking the question, what are the human resource development needs for this kind of restructuring, and how does our educational system fit into the restructuring goals that uh, we set up? Uh, I know every single island including Antigua, would be looking at options. One of the big options that is being considered in Jamaica is the development of some logistics port that will take advantage of the expansion of the Panama Canal in 2014-2015, where much bigger container ships will be able to pass through the canal. And they're looking at a logistics port in Kingston that can benefit from that. So there are many ideas that, are, that need to be not only at the level of the cabinet, parliament, but they need to be discussed in the political parties. Can we move to the structure, the, high, the higher levels of debt? This is just to indicate uh, the high level of debt as a percentage of GDP. In December 2011, the debt is 68% of gross domestic product, domestic, uh, the, the GDP. And the external debt is 57. And total debt is 127. So your total debt in its excess of GDP, 125. So all your GDP cannot match your debt. Figures I got from Mr. Jardine indicate that Antigua has brought down its debt to GDP 
it's not about 100% level. That's the data I, I got from you. Uh, high levels of debt uh, hamper the, the, the system. The next table. Okay, we won't go into much detail, but this is just the debt maturity structure, uh, which indicates the, the period when debt becomes, debt has to be paid, when interest rates, when things mature. And it's just a, a, a table that shows the accounting that the Ministry of Finance has to do to ensure that those who buy, those who have things that the government people come into um, maturity, 2.5 years, 2 years, 1.5. Every year, this is really where the bulk of the tax revenue goes into paying back uh, the, the debt. There's this, this table is uh, persistent fiscal deficit deviation from projections. What this table simply does, it charts, can you go back to that? Mm -hmm. It charts from, two, from 1999 to 2011. At every time government says it's going to reduce the fiscal deficit, that is to say the amount it spends that is in excess of what it earns. And each time it goes deeper and deeper till it, the fiscal deficit reaches by um, 2010, 2011, uh, over 12%. So Ministry of Finance bureaucrats spend a lot of time dealing with this. But this indicates political decisions that are made concerning uh, the, the budget. Uh, let me end by saying that the, whilst I've focused in the final section on the economy, I think in recent times in the Caribbean, Caribbean political discussion has abandoned the economic questions to technocrats, to economists. Now, all of these things can be broken down in ways that ordinary people can understand who benefits, who loses from public decisions that are made. And public decisions really start within the party leadership. And that's why I'm so insistent that more attention needs to be paid to our political parties. Uh, in over the past 20 or so years, a lot of attention has been placed on governance mechanisms. And I agree with that governance mechanisms. But believe you me, the power behind Caribbean governments, uh, whether or not you have a regional perspective or don't have a regional perspective, uh, it starts inside the political party and what the political party does. So I, I want to end uh, by referring to the conclusions I started out with that uh, in assessing the Caribbean, uh, there are countries that have gotten some things right, some more than others. And it's up to you to look at what Antigua has gotten right. Uh, secondly, the struggle for values is, in my view, one of the most fundamental things. Because the response of the young people to all this data and the consequences of it is that they are going to hustle US dollars from retired Americans. That's their game. And that game so far has, is, has there are young people in Jamaica who have parties where they burn U.S. dollars, right? Literally, so who can burn the most dollars? So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a mindset and a way of thinking and living that is central to the future of Caribbean politics. Uh, some may argue that I put too much stress on political parties and that our experience with them 
has not been as good and it's not likely to get better. But you have to go where the people are voting to assess and to try to influence that development. And this is why uh, I have focused on the, uh, uh, the need for party reform and the need for this to take place in a way so that the civil society organizations, which are there anyhow, can be more effective in the agenda, which is so necessary for the Caribbean today, which is the economic agenda, the values agenda, uh, and which is also uh, the, the environmental agenda. So that those things can come to the forefront of our political, social, and cultural life. Thank you very much.